the I pay my respects to their elders, both past and present. I want to emphasize that this acknowledgement is not made in a tokenistic manner. I recognize the profound suffering inflicted upon the uh, First Nations over the past 230 years. And I deeply regret that we have not yet taken more significant steps towards meaningful reconciliation. I am Fernanda Trecenti, the vice chair and events manager for the Victorian branch of the Fagans. And we are here today to discuss our housing crisis, specifically focusing on the recent plan announced by the Victorian government to address the issue. When discussing housing, it is crucial to remember that we are addressing a fundamental human necessity. Housing shouldn't be reduced to a mere, mere commodity <coughs> traded and capitalized on by a privileged few. Housing is not just a need, it's a human right. Everyone deserves the dignity of a roof over their head. As a community, it's our collective responsibility to ensure that no individual in our society is denied the fundamental right to a stable and secure home. And we are incredibly fortunate today to hear from two respected voices in the field Michael Buxton and Iris Le Levin. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here, for generously giving your time and for sharing your valuable knowledge. Thank you. And I will introduce our first speaker, um, Michael Buxton. Uh, he's an emeritus professor at RMIT University. He's one of Australia's most well-known academics in urban and regional affairs and appears regularly in Australian media. He has published in extensively, co-authoring 20 books or monographs and over 80 articles in various forms. He has worked in senior positions in government, including the Victorian Government Planning and Environment, Environment Agencies. So please um, join me welcome. <laughs> Well, thank you for the introduction. Um, probably a bit longer than my speech is going to be. So, uh, so thank you very much. And it's, 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 it really is a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm glad to be among Fabian socialists. I think John Howard thought you all disappeared years ago. So <laughs> it's good to see that there's still people around who care about Fabian socialism. Um, and I know that you're deeply concerned about um, broad social issues such as housing. So we've divided up the, the topic <clears throat> as best we can by putting a guillotine through it. So there should be more guillotines, I think. <laughs> um, and Iris is going to do the public housing <clears throat> side of things, and I'm I'm going to concentrate on what I really want to, and that's the private housing market. Uh, and what's happening to Melbourne. So um, I better make sure that I get my timing right here so I don't go on too long, because once I start on private housing, um, it's not a good look. <laughs> um, so look, I, I think cities go through periods in their development um, where every so often they they come to a, a really critical point in in um, in the way they are developing and 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 a period in, in in a period which determines how they're going to develop for a long time. And I think we're in that now. Um, <clears throat> it's been building up um, through the last ten years in the type of development that's been occurring in Melbourne. Uh, we've been gradually being turned into a high-rise city, <clears throat> um, very similarly in many ways to the sort of city that the mega cities that are appearing, particularly in Asia and China. Uh, we've turned away from the, the traditional European model of of change. Um, if we have to change, 
where we have dense, highly livable city centres. There's lots of lots of lots of elements to European cities which are terrible, um, particularly when you get out towards the fringe and you get to high rise with <clears throat> uh, lower social income groups and so on. They're not great places, but the traditional European city. Uh, which, by the way, most of the European capitals were pulled down in the 19th century from their medieval and later medieval periods and turned into the, into 19th century cities. But they they turned them into the sort of city that our politicians love. They're pulling Melbourne down, but they get out, they fly off to Prague and Paris and and so on every so often. Uh, that's the city that we're not becoming, and yet that's the city that they get out to as quickly as possible. They don't go for their holidays to Beijing. They go to European cities and love it. So we've had a choice. Um, we've got high rates of immigration um, that are accounting for our population increase. Um, and state governments are trying to respond to that. It's, it's an unenviable position to be in because <clears throat> federal policy is, is bringing in huge numbers of people. I mean, Mel and, and most of the people are coming to live in Sydney, Melbourne, and, and to a lesser extent, southeast Queensland. That's where they're living. Um, Adelaide is not increasing much in population. I used to joke to my my students, look, you know, anyone from Adelaide in the in the group and some poor benighted people would put their hands up and say, We're very sorry for you, you know. <clears throat> Adelaide is going to be the place to live. A right? city of a million and a half people with all the cultural attributes that we value, lots of wine regions around, you know, what a place it's going to be. Um, and the city that we used to be is going, and it's going to go at a, at a, at a, at a rapid rate, and that, that rate is going to increase. So our choice has been... How are we going to cope with this massive population increase that the, the federal government is, is um, deciding for the country? How are state governments going to respond? And state governments are responding in a, in a really alarming way. And, and, and they're, they're typical. Every state government is adopting um, a kind of neo, neo, neoliberal planning regime. It's, it's not just the old market-based. It, it's... It's, it's now become uh, uh, a removal of the rules coupled with a centralised authoritarian um, orientation. So governments have stepped in and they've said, look, if we're going, to, if we're going to meet these population targets and let's have a look at what they are. I mean, Melbourne um, up until last year increased uh, by one million people in the previous seven and a half years. <laughs> and with the population increases that, that are projected, we're talking about um, Melbourne. Uh, it's, it's always difficult to make predictions, but the government is predicting a city of 9 million by 2056. And the rate of growth is absolutely enormous. It's not seven, it's not going to be seven and a half years. And the rates of immigration and an increase in population is going to be about five years. So we're, we're going through this exponential um, rate of increase in population, state government saying, how are we going to respond to this? Their answer has been to impose a top-down authoritarian new planning regime that is the most fundamental change in the history of the Melbourne and Victorian planning system. And I, I just find that extraordinary that uh, a government that is elected by the people, it's supposed to be a democratic government, has decided to develop a new um, set of planning rules to, to impose a new um, land use pattern on, on, on the state and particularly Melbourne by stealth without telling anybody what they've done until they decide to tell us. So for four years, they've been developing a new planning regime. And uh, the, the group that's been developing it have been the property interests, <clears throat> um, some of the consulting um, firms, 
uh, a network of insiders in the in the Labor Party, uh, and they've developed these new rules. Uh, and under Daniel Andrews, they've decided that this has to be done this way because the people can't be trusted. I mean, they're treating residents in Melbourne as the enemy. <clears throat> and as a as a liberal democratic, supposedly liberal democratic government, I just find it amazing that they would do it and they, they seem to be getting away with it. Now, the big question for the people of, of the city is whether they're going to let them get away with it. <laughs> because they've developed these new rules by stealth and the new rules are basically, I'll, I'll just quickly run through them. I'm not going to bore you with um, the details of a statutory planning system. We can just run through the key principles, but they've developed them by stealth and they've imposed them on the community so that um, residents have no rights. Uh, often they're not even going to know what developments are being proposed, no right of appeal, and where there are alleged rights, the, the, the government, which is going to make all these decisions, can remove them if it wishes. So the Minister for Planning, they're at the Minister's discretion uh, to advertise, uh, and even if the minister does advertise them, uh, which probably won't happen, and in some cases it's been ruled out, there's no appeal. So um, <clears throat> basically what the government's done is introduced a new pathway, I love that word, pathway, a new route for development approval that is sp specifically designed for big development interests. It's, governed by the amount of money that the developer is prepared to, to um, invest, generally between 20 and between 10 and, and 30 million dollars. So they can come in and they can build um, a, according to uh, the new rules, um, high rise, medium rise, um, and they can also build office retail, often in residential areas. Um, none of this has been made known yet. It's, it's going to be, though. Um, and when it starts to happen, it's going to be very interesting to see the, what the rea reaction of the people of Melbourne uh, are going to be. So I'll just quickly just run you through some yeah. of them. Uh, this is, um, is it um, Halloween day today or was it yesterday? <laughs> today, well, this is an absolute classic Halloween story. This is a horror story. <laughs> Worse than anybody out there is undergoing. I'm giving you Halloween special today. So, okay, what are the what are some of the key elements of this? Well, <clears throat> firstly, there's a thing called future homes for apartments. So, the government is going to allow land that's zoned general residential and doesn't have a heritage overlay. And there's a hell of a lot of land like that. Right? There's land in the inner suburbs with the heritage overlay and in neighborhood residential zone, which is a more heritage focused zone. But the general residential zone is the standard zone. And there's, it's generally, that's that's the primary residential zone. Um, and most of the residential land is zoned general residential. So any of that area, any of that zone, within 800 meters of a passenger railway station, Okay, there's not many of them, but there's a few. Um, within 800 metres of a metropolitan major or neighbourhood uh, activity centre. So basically, big, medium or small, tiny shopping centres within 800 metres within Melbourne can be redeveloped. Um, and we don't know <clears throat> fully the rules for redevelopment, but basically they're saying... They're putting up a, a specified set of development standards um, and sort of coming up with, um, they call them licensed apartment templates. So there's a, a number of template designs for apartments, height, size, and type, um, to meet specified development standards like room sizes and so on. So if a developer selects from that, list of apartment types and sizes and so on, they can put them within 800 metres of a shopping centre, no matter how big, or a rail, a rail station, 
um, so long as it's general residential. Now, that's a lot of land, right? And um, the municipal council's chief executive officer will be the responsible authority, not the council. Right? That's a ripper, isn't it? So you elect the councillors. When I last looked, they're supposed to be in a democracy. And the councillors will have absolutely no say. Um, they've done a few other things. Very quickly, I'll just let you know what they are. Um, I think the most objectionable have been two new particular provisions. So the planning scheme consists of a layered series of, of, of provisions. This was a Robert McClellan invention, along with his um, minions and, and helpers. And they came up with this incredibly complex planning system, which is layered, zones, overlays, particular provisions, you know, the list goes on, policies, local policies, and you get concussion trying to read this stuff. Um, so the government's brought in two new particular provisions and they apply, they're mandatory provisions and they apply no matter what the zones say. That's the point of a particular provision. And they're, they're introducing uh, these provisions to allow a series of uses, 22 new uses, no matter what the current planning scheme says. So if you live in a zone, you expect that, you know, if you live in residential, you expect houses are going to go there. But no, you'll be able to, they'll be able to, uh, the government under this new pathway will be able to consider applications for retail, for office. Um, in the Green Wedge, um, they, 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 uh, um, have either prohibitions or very strong controls on tourist-related developments and accommodation and so on in order to stop the green wedges being turned into mini suburbs, right? I know that, that'll be able to be overridden by one of these particular provisions um, to allow these new uses to go into green wedges if the minister thinks so. So the minister becomes a responsible authority, the decision maker. Um, and... Um, the minister can waive or vary any building height, any setback. They can the minister can vary notice requirements, and there's no there's no right of review. Now, I mean, it's bad enough to have these kind of draconian provisions that allow development all over the place. When we've come up, we've been brought up with a system where. It's supposed to be a, an organised, rational system designed to protect amenity and allow people to understand what can and can't go somewhere. That's just being overthrown so that developers can go have a... It's called the Development development Facilitation Program. And that's, that's about the only honest bit of this entire thing. It is designed to facilitate development, big time. Um, and they go to the minister because the minister is the decision maker in these cases. And rights of review and notification are fundamentally affected. Now, I just, yeah, I just find it staggering that a government uh, in a democracy can, first of all, impose these kind of controls, but also treat residents. Uh, and electors in the way that they're doing it. They're doing so by cutting people out of, out of the equation. So that's kind of what 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 is being proposed. And I'll, I'll just finish up with um, before the um, the pit of crocodile opens up and swallows me. Um, this has all been brilliantly manipulated by the property industry and the and the government. They've, they've now had for about two years a narrative that's come out that we've, we've got a housing crisis. And Iris will talk about this from the public housing side of things. We've got a housing crisis. Why have we got a housing crisis? Because in the private market, there's not enough houses, right? But there's enough approvals, more than enough approvals to meet demand since 2005. Um, in fact, more than enough because developers are not building a lot of the approved dwellings. There's estimates up to 100,000 that have been approved that haven't been constructed in the private market. Um, and up until 
mid early 2022 this was all working quite well and then certainly in the last um 12 to 18 months the number of dwelling private dwelling constructions has dropped but it's got nothing to do with the approvals the approvals have been made the councils have approved although they've dropped off in recent times because developers are not putting as many applications in because they can't get them built so the drop in numbers of completed dwellings is purely because of problems with the development industry they haven't got the labor they've had supply supply chain problems costs have gone up massively as anyone who tried to renovate a kitchen lately can testify um, but the approvals were were more outmatched demand until 2020. Uh, the, the, the developers have been saying they need to be building about 50 to 57,000 dwellings. Yeah, we've been building that since 2014, and in 2021, uh, there were there were um, 71,000 approvals, well above the the, the yearly average. So. Approvals are not the problem. And yet the government and the development industry is with the with the support of groups like the Grattan Institute, economists never get land use planning. The Grattan Institute cannot understand the planning regime. I've tried to explain it. Why don't they understand? I mean, it's not that hard, is it? But they don't get it. So they've come out and said we've got a crisis in you know, in approvals, and it's false. It's a false narrative, but it's been pushed by the government with the development industry to create this sense of crisis in the private housing market, saying the only solution is for the government to come in over the top with draconian solutions and to impose the solution because local government's hopeless, and guess what? There's a whole other NIMBY um, residents out there mm. that are stopping development. Now, that's false. But it's been unbelievably effective uh, and it's won the day. And so the government has been able to come in on the back of this narrative and impose this solution saying we've had to do it because residents are selfish and local councils are hopeless. Now, look, a lot of local councils are pretty hopeless. I'm the first to admit it, but they're not that hopeless. Um, so that's that's been the problem. Um, and finally, the middle ring residents are the real problem, right? Because they're the worst NIMBYs. Well, when we look at the figures, there's been about 100,000 um, you know, high-rise uh, approved since 2005, mainly since about 2012 when Matthew Guy started to run a bit of muck. About 100,000 high-rise apartments um, okay. approved. We look at the middle ring approvals, high rise and medium rise apartments and and uh, attached row houses, attached townhouse type developments, it's double that. Uh, it's about 200,000. There's no missing middle. So they've invented this term, there's a missing middle, all because there's not enough development occurring in the, in the middle ring suburbs. So the age today has a headline, right? The, the middle suburbs are going to be redeveloped in order to meet the needs. So it's it's they're attacking, they know who they're attacking, they know why, and they're being and they're getting away with it brilliantly. So whether or not this works, oh, we'll have to wait and see. Finally, why is it happening? It's happening because the government is on a growth kick. It has accepted this whole this whole program of a big country and a big city. Um, why has it done that? It gets 50% of state-based income from land-related taxes. Right? 50%. Now, the Commonwealth, of course, they have other sources of income, but that's the state-based income. The construction in industry accounts for about 9% of GDP. Um, and the construction unions, the property industry, the finance industry and the big consulting firms are the most powerful network in this country. And the government is responding to that. It's short term. They want to do this. And there are other ways. And 
<clears throat> the other way that I keep proposing, but I, 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 I don't, I don't get a look in with government on this. I'm, I'm going to have one more go at it. But is to have residents, local councils, the state government, and the property industry get together and work out what to build and where. Right now, if we think that's hard, some councils have actually done this, and they've worked out how many people could fit into the municipality with certain rules, keep your heritage um, and amenity factors, right? Don't pull down your heritage shops and your, and, your, and your heritage housing. Keep your high amenity, right? And they've worked out where you can put new development and what type of development, how it fits in with prevailing streetscapes and needs and so on. And they've come up with more housing than what the government actually wants. And yet the government is ignoring this as a potential and saying our solution is the only one and that has got to be authoritarian imposition of what we think is going to be the future they want to impose on all of us. And it's going to be very interesting to see how the citizens of Melbourne react. Thanks very much. Thank you, Michael. Um, so now our second speaker, Dr. Iris Levin. She's an architect, urban planner, educator, and researcher. She's a lecturer at RMIT. Iris' uh, research includes investigations into housing for disadvantaged communities and the interface between diversity and the built environment, particularly in cities. Iris published Migration, Settlement, and the Concepts of Home and House in 2016, and she is the lead editor of Migration and Urban Transitions in Australia, a 2022 publication. Iris' um, work has appeared in key journals in the fields of housing studies, migration studies, and urban planning. So please join me to welcome Iris. I'm going to share in the way that. Okay. Yes. Can you see here? And can you see the top? Yes. Yes. Okay. So you're telling them to speak. So it's. Yes. I'll tell you that you just speak here. Um, when I. Yeah. Thank you very much. And, um, hi, everyone. Um, Pleasure to be here and thanks for inviting me. Um, I'd like to also acknowledge the uh, Wandui people of the Kulin nations and their ancestors um, and paying my respect to uh, the elders past and present. And I also want to um, reach out to everyone who's been affected uh, by the developments in the Middle East and Eastern Europe. Um, yeah. I just felt that I had to say that. Yeah, so, yeah. Okay, so I'm not um, as knowledgeable or don't have that experience as Michael. I prepared um, some material to show you. Um, and I think it's a lot. So I wanted also to know how much you know and what to what level I need to explain. Um, so I was going to talk about a little bit about what is social housing in Australia and Victoria, um, and then a little bit about the housing statement and the, what the plan is um, of the Victorian government, and then about relocation experiences that I've, you know, a research that I've done um, about relocation experiences of the Carlton Redevelopment Project. Um, let's see. So, so I don't know how how many of you you know anything about social housing now. Yeah. You know a little bit. Yeah. Okay, so I don't need to talk. All right, that's good. So, um, I'll just say uh, quickly that social housing uh, in Australia um, includes both community housing and public housing, mostly. Um, the stock in, is still uh, public housing, but there's a trend uh, to transfer stock from public housing 
to community housing organization. Public housing is dwellings um, managed and owned by government, um, state or territory government. And community housing um, is a dwelling, rental dwelling, both, um, managed by community housing providers, organizations, and sometimes owned mostly leased or um, um, only managed. There's also other um, uh, state um, or territory on um, indigenous housing that we don't have in Victoria, and there's also community indigenous community housing providers. But you can see the majority is still public housing, and you can see over the last 17 years or something, there's a drop of uh, public housing, a bit more community housing, um, and almost a stable kind of um, stock in general, a little bit increased. But mostly in community housing. And in Victoria, we have mostly still public housing. Um, in Tasmania, for example, they've really transferred most of the stock to community housing, which means um, moving public, transferring public stock, public housing stock to kind of private, semi private, non for profit organizations. Um, yes. In terms of percentage um, of dwellings of um, or household, Victoria has the least uh, um, um, number of households living in uh, social housing. Uh, if you look at the grey bar, this is what you know the percentage and the numbers are the grey bar. Um, Australia wide, we have about four percent of. Um, um, social housing dwellings and households living in social housing. And international perspective, you can see that Australia here it's 3.8. I'm not sure what's the difference because it's from around 2020, both, both graphs. So, but um, the Netherlands has about 30% of social housing. Um, then Austria, uh, Australia is lower than um, the EU, which is seven and a half, and the OECD um, countries, which is 6.9. Um, how to see um, the management briefly as uh, tenants uh, pay for public housing 25% of um, the income, whatever income it is. Um, community housing providers sometimes have, you know, they target uh, cohorts, for example, youth or older people or women. Um, yeah, most states and territories have a common uh, register, which means when someone applies for um, social housing, they can get either public or um, community housing, if, if they're happy to um, to get either. Uh, and there's some differences between community and, and um, public housing, but we don't have time to, we can talk about it later. Oh. Yeah. Okay, this is in Victoria. I don't know what you can see. It doesn't really matter. Uh, yes, yeah, it's not here, it's, it's on your screen. We can't see it. Yeah, that's it's because of the cross two screens. 
So you just need to look on the screen as you move the mouse. Yeah. And the mouse uh -huh. comes up. You've got two screens. Yeah. Yeah. There you are. Now right. find the X. Ah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so the, in Victoria, we have the VHR, which is the Victorian Housing Register. We have them in all states and territories, which is the common register, um, except for the Northern Territory. And you can see from last June, this year, um, there's about 65 people southern people waiting for um, social housing to be allocated. Um, there's diff there's a priority list, which is the one here. And then the, there's um, the general list, which people on the general uh, list probably don't have yet, um, any is chance in getting house. Applications or? Appli applications, number of applications. Um, so that in the priority, there's a number of categories such as emergency housing, people who've been um, affected by fires and floods, um, people experiencing homelessness, um, people with disability, women fleeing, you know, domestic violence and children, uh, etc. To get into to get allocated, you have to be you have to have multiple disadvantaged. So yeah. You have to have a number of issues. Usually, it's not. It's very difficult to, as you can see, we have um, a very um, small stock of ha social housing, and many people in need more and more. Yeah. So, and that's where um, the Victorian government announced uh, the housing statement, um, and Michael talked about. All of these issues, or most of them, and I'll talk about the the point that they made about building more social housing. And they had a number of points here, and um, which I can't really speak. The different ideas and not not enough um, details um, that they provided, but I can speak uh, of on the first one, which what they call launch uh, Australia. The biggest ever urban renewal project, and by that they mean retiring the forty-four older um, older public housing towers. Mostly, all of them are in in the in the city, including Carlton and basically all all of the ones towers that were built in the sixties and seventies. And um, Yes, yeah, so what, do, what does it mean? Demolishing 44 towers, relocating in these 44 towers, there are about 10,000 people living currently, um, relocating them to other, you know, dwellings, um, re rebuilding the sites, redeveloping. Um, and then what they say in the, in the statement, housing about 30,000 um, people, they don't really say how housing, what we think is going to happen. But they haven't really said it. Uh, usually, when I don't know how much you know about the you know public housing redevelopment that has been happening in Victoria in the last 15, 20 years, um, now they promise, the government promises to um, increase supply in 10%, by 10%. That means they're going to probably have 11,000 um, people living in social housing on these estates and another 19,000 um, private residents, which is... Yeah. This is the mistake that's being made. It's not about 10,000 tenants, it's about 10,000 tenancies. You know, there are 9,970,000 9, dwellings in high-rise buildings. So, so uh, households. Occupation is three persons per tenancy. Talking about thirty thousand people right now who live in high mm. Okay. Not yeah. Okay. So. And the so it's not tenants; it's households, right? right? Households, not tenants. Yeah. That's what you mean. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. In fact, you're um, twenty-five percent of income from all the houses and so forth. 
Yes, yes, yes. That's, that's the difference between community housing and public housing. That's not, so that's not 25% of your income, that's 44% of your income. Okay. For that's community housing. From, yes. From the Commonwealth yes. well, banks. So public housing, the, uh, tenants, they don't get the CRA, the Commonwealth Rental Assistance, yeah. but community it's, housing, you do. And if it's stated it's a non-for-profit organisation, when going through the... Um, the the uh, report annual report okay they had over two thousand clients they made over fifty million okay and they weren't developing any more properties until they could find more people to do so okay. and the, and the way that it was maintained was a disgrace which can we this is something to be dealt with yeah later. maybe we can talk about it later yeah yeah that's interesting and thank you for that we'll talk about it later maybe during discussion um so what they also it it doesn't really matter if it's tenants or household it matters because there's more people uh being affected Yes, what happened? But but um but the point is they're going to increase in te by ten percent and also include a lot of public um uh, private um housing, private uh dwelling. That also means uh, they will have to relocate large communities. As you know, in these power, the established communities, lots of, you know, um, immigrants from, from usually, you know, in Carlton, it's uh, Somali, in North Melbourne, it's um, Sudanese, I think, and uh, Vietnamese in, in uh, Fitzroy, etc. What they also said, and it's not very clear how they're going to do it, they're not going to sell the land like they've done previously. Um, they're going to lease it to developers they're going to um, use a uh, private public uh, partnership like they've done, but not sell the land from public to um, private, but lease it for 40 years. It's still not completely clear how they're going to do it and all the details. Um, what is interesting to know and important that the towers, these towers have been neglected and haven't been really refurbished um, since they were built. I mean, there were except for the Carlton one. No, uh, been uh, actually, a whole lot of them have been renovated. Yeah. 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 Sorry, yeah. you're wrong. Well, right. Until until then, when was that? Well, they were, the Brunswick one well, had yeah. been done about fifteen years ago. Oh, really? Ben of really Ben of Melbourne one finished about ten years ago. They converted three bedroom apartments. The so why is why do they say it's not the eleven older person towers, which are also being installed, have all been upgraded and yeah. updated. Some were just getting air conditioning in the summer in one in Albert Park. Which one is that? The older the people Victoria Avenue Albert Park. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um so they've all been updated over the last 15 so well, why uh, do they think they're not um, fit for, you know, railing? They, they are fit and they have a whole range of old people. In the yeah, so that's interesting. Um, I, uh, I would it, tell you absolutely any. Yeah. Uh, and uh, look at what we're looking at. No, but. 19,000 private residents. This is just a gift for public land. To uh, no, the, no, the, no, the, no, the, no, but no, social no. housing by ten percent to eleven thousand when we got sixty five thousand on the waiting list. What a disgrace! I think it's really interesting. Um, it doesn't matter if they um renovated or not. I know in Ascotville and 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 these estates that have been recently, you know, demolished and and um the Mel Port Melbourne uh, Bar Beacon estate. They haven't uh, renovated them. Yeah. And that was the excuse for demolishing. 
and um, it's kind of almost in purpose not renovating to then being able to well we don't know I, I'm I'm happy to hear that I'm wrong but I think I'm not okay let's continue let we'll talk about it um yeah so what they say they don't they say the government they say they pay no accessibility all these standards yeah. I don't know if you you're saying they're not no, they did catch now with climate change yeah. Okay. Yeah. But you said they've been um, renovated and it was that just listened to you. Yeah, okay. Um, what I think, you know, I haven't seen, and I don't think others have seen, feasibility studies of the of the public housing towers uh, being made and so showing that um it's it's actually feasible to demolish them and we be hey i don't know if i have time to talk about my experiences in the study of um, relocation in carlton if you're interested i can briefly going to that. Yes, please. Yeah. So um it's a study I was involved in when the first the Ligon site was completed, not the whole uh, redevelopment. Uh, between the study was between 2011 and 2014. And um, at the time the Carlton um estate redevelopment was the biggest um, in Victoria, uh, and the idea was to create a socially mixed community, which was kind of, you know, very hype at the, at the time, and um, tenure mix, um, people in private housing, living side by side, people public housing. That didn't really um, happen. So I guess you all know, um, the three sites, um, the, the Carlton estate had two two sites and uh, additional Keppel Street, so Ligon, Elgin, and Keppel Street, a Keppel site that was added, but not originally um, public housing. So what they've done, demolished the walk-ups, not the towers, right? The walk-ups in El Elgin and the Ligon um, Street site. And because of the, that was the first site, the first building after they demolished it um, was open um, at Ligon, and that's the focus of my research. So I talked to people who lived um, previously in the walk-ups, moved away or didn't, they came back or didn't come back, and, um, and asked them questions about relocation experiences. I also talked to people in private housing because they built a complex of one big public housing. I have, I have the, but not here. I mean, in another presentation, um, a public housing building and two uh, private, private housing apartment blocks just near. I mean, all of it, as you probably know, is now private um, buildings, but there's one. Uh, public um, housing building, which is not the towers. The towers have been kept, right? So this is the focus of my research. That was, yeah. We looked at, uh, we didn't do that, that the government did the baseline study in 2009, and, and they found that local uh, residents in, in the neighborhood in Carlton um, and service providers didn't like the estate and, and the grant. But um, tenants actually liked it, uh, positive views. And, and these are the topics that we looked at. Um, I just have to say that I was, this was uh, funded by the Australian Research Council and um, led by two researchers from, uh, yeah, no, that's okay. Yeah, 
uh, from Flinders University, um, Kathy Arthurson and Anna Ziesch. So in terms of the yeah. development process and public consultation was a big issue. The tenants didn't feel they were consulted. Um, some said they were, uh, but they mostly were informed. So they weren't asked any, anything meaningful about the social mixed design and how they want to live side by side and um, what will happen. There was the CLC, Community Liaison um, Committee. Tenants didn't feel they could come and, and, and just attend. They felt uh, intimidated. Um, and you can see in the quote that, you know, it was kind of almost a tick in the box exercise, but not really consultation. If there was consultation, it was about uh, which apartment design would you prefer, A or B, but nothing meaningful about how the buildings are going to stand and, and you know, how the mix with private residence is going to happen. And um, from, from our interviews, we had that was probably because the developers had a lot of power in negotiation because it happened um, during the GFC and the government wanted them to just gave almost everything. We don't know how much um, the government or how much they paid for the land, but they got the land. Yeah, grants, uh, building and grants quality. Um, of course, most most tenants. So I didn't say I spoke with, I interviewed um around thirty, a bit more tenants who came back or stayed away after uh, relocation, and ten private residents from the buildings nearby and 10 service providers. So those who came back were very happy to be back in a new building. They got a new apartment. Um, but some were disappointed with the neighbors and that the, the building is not family oriented that um, have been promised to them. I, I don't know, have we missed one? Okay, no, no. Okay. Um, <clears throat> social networks. Ah, social yeah. I think we might have missed it. Anyway, I'll, I'll say. Um, so the housing department staff um, really made a lot of effort to accommodate people's you know, wishes. If they wanted to stay um, around, around Carlton, they found um, a flat to, to accommodate them either in the high rises that were there, uh, remained, or in smaller estates around Carlton. And that, so most people were very happy. If they wanted to move away to the suburbs, to outer suburbs, they got that. Um, the problem was that we couldn't really access, contact people who moved away if they, because lots of uh, social ties have been, you know, um, lost. Because people just knew would meet each other, but didn't have didn't have at the time mobile phones, and so they just you know lost contact with lots of their um, friends. Also, some people had I don't know. I think that was a, a miss. Um, so relocation started. They demolished the buildings in two thousand and six. Some people left three years earlier, so 2003 or something. Some people didn't want to leave until the last minute, so they only left it in 2006. Then that building opened back in 2011. So at least five years away, you know, people with families, young kids, they got into school, so many of them didn't want to come back. So about only about 20% of the people who relocated came back to the building, which is usually the case. And, and maybe that's okay. I mean, yeah, some people um, also prefer to stay away because they, um, so what happened, they liked the new housing that they got. What happened, they got um, 
So the walk-ups were all three bedroom flats, so family unit, what they call, and that's one of the reasons they want to demolish them because there's a lot of um, underutilization, flats that are empty or bedrooms that are empty uh, because there are many tenants who live alone. So they, when they moved away and relocated, they got uh, people got three bedroom flats anywhere else. When they came back, they were reassessed. So the government, the department reassessed them and their needs. And sometimes many of them got only one bedroom apartment if they lived uh, on their own and they didn't have a care or some, some of them did have a care and still got one bedroom. So some of them didn't want to come back. So there was a lot of anger and frustration because they didn't know it's going to happen. They hadn't known uh, when they moved away. So that was um, a big issue. Uh, also in terms of social uh, networks, people liked living ne next to each other in terms of you know private and public, but there weren't any meaningful connections, probably because in Carlton, there weren't any design community spaces for people to interact. There was complete separation. Even, um, I don't know if you know about the internal courtyard between the three buildings. The wall. The wall and, um, and the internal courtyard is only, um, you know, accessible by private residents. And that was part of the development, developers kind of, you know, um, negotiation to, to, to get. And the government, yeah. Uh, security, safety, security, yeah, a very important issue for many of the people I spoke with. But um, yeah, that was kind of not completely clear. Some felt that um, um, the whole estate was much more secure and safe and didn't have issues like in the high rise next door. Some felt the building wasn't secure enough. Uh, stigma, stigma and reputation. Of course, the new building looked beautiful, so people said um, they really felt you know there's a difference in the way people treat them. But others said um, you know it's it's just not going to change. Um, just it's a superficial change. So that was. Yeah, and finally, health and well-being. Uh, yeah, for some people, it was a really difficult process, relocation, staying away, losing networks. Um, some people loved it, so it wasn't completely, um, yeah, one way or another. There, we could see some, you know, general improvement in health and well-being. Um, even those who stayed away, some wanted to stay away. So, so um, it's not um, conclusive, I guess. But in general, uh, what we concluded is that, you know, outcomes have been made um, of relocation experiences. Um, and you can see here, but mostly what this whole redevelopment um, the, it was enabling the mixed income, mixed fund, funding, finance um, objectives, very neoliberal objectives that the government doesn't fully pay for public housing. Now it's private developers paying. Um, and, and really the real issues, social, social issues uh, have been neglected. And for example, the displacement and loss of community, um, Reduction in public housing bedroom, I didn't talk about that, but although they increased the number of um, households, they reduced the number of bedrooms. So that means less people are able to, to, to be housed and public land, of course. So that's huge issues. Um, also, because we didn't interview people who moved away and stayed away as much, we couldn't contact them. It may be biased to a more positive view. Um, and finally, I guess, I don't know. So we talked about feasibility studies. I, I don't know if you know about um, the office practice, which is an architectural practice. And um, again, not non-profit, 
Um, and they've done feasibility studies for Bar Beacon and Ascot Vale um, estates. And they found that with the, um, you know, retrofitting and infill, we could save a lot of money. The only um, issue for me is that these are not high rises, but these are low rises, quite the medium density, but low rises, um, or kind of, you know, two or three um, stories. There's another issue that, um, another example uh, in Fitzroy, they added a social housing development um, instead of the car park, I think, or open space that was there. And then, so people didn't have to relocate and just, you know, infill in the building, in the area. I guess, you know, the main takeaway uh, that if, if um, we decide, the government decides to relocate, which seems to be the case, needs to be um, deep engagement with, with tenants, community, um, and somehow to retain community and not, not disperse them. No selling of public land seems to be the case, but we don't really know. And the last, I think the last, this is for, taken from the office uh, website. This is what they kind of, you know, designed for a uh, bark beacon um, estate. So you can see better fitting and infilling, um, increasing, achieving all the government goal, goals. Um, one other thing is that demolishing the uh, towers is very difficult. And we've seen that, I think the government demolished um, once in Kensington and realized it was very, very, very difficult, much more difficult than what they expected. So this is a huge task, and I'm not sure why it needs to be done by demolishing and dismantling all communities. Yeah. Thank you. We are just, uh, um, I think maybe, Jackson, you want to remove this? Yeah, I think we will. Sorry. Yeah, just stop sharing. And should I put the microphone on the table? I think. No. I think it will be easier, right? Yeah. The cameras are being monitored. Yeah, I'll move that as well. So. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Does that work? Yeah. No. More down one. That's it. And just down a bit. And down. Just it. angle it down. Yep. Oh, there yeah. we go. Okay. So I want to thank you both. I'm sure like we have a, a lot. Uh, there will be a lot of questions. Such a uh, you know an important issue. So uh, I think there were uh, yes there were a couple of people that. Did I get to ask, please? Uh, yeah, I think uh, nothing's accidental. Everything uh, is deliberate. Uh, we've had 40 years of class war uh, by the neoliberal privatising flat tax mediocrity. We've got 3.8 million unnecessarily in, in poverty. We've got um, uh, unlimited rent increases uh, by landlords. Uh, and um, uh, 8 million largely unwanted immigrants in 20 years, oh, plus another 1.5 million uh, right now, Dangerous. when 2.9 million Australian workers are unemployed or underemployed according to Roy Morgan uh, Pons. So um, uh, I just think it's a disgrace that those three sites in North of Preston and North Melbourne uh, have been just sold. 90% luxury apartments, okay. including $3 million uh, uh, penthouses, uh, and the people have, have got about ten percent, just like you, you've said there. We've increased the ten thousand public tenants by ten percent. Big deal. And, and whether you're selling our public land to these developers or losing it to them on the ninety nine years or whatever it is, there's no different. Uh, it's still, uh, you know, this evil. Um, uh, uh, this mental disease of neoliberalism and privatisation 
that's in my yeah. opinion. I agree. I <laughs> Yeah, if you want to say anything. Uh, no, but no, no, it's not. Yeah, it can be. I think it was, it so, was just a comment. Yeah. Um, do we have any other questions here? Yeah. I just wanted to give a little historical perspective. In 1982, the Labour government came in after 27 years in Victoria. The then housing director, Dr. White Hubert, came to Ian Cathy as a minister saying, my plan is to demolish the high rise power. <laughs> but that was the first thing that the minister was confronted with in 1980. That never happened because immediately, A, there's no money, there's a huge backlog. The policy is to double the proportion of all public housing in percentage terms of all private housing. That also, of course, never happened. Money for it. So that, that is the sort of thing that happened. So I'm, I'm quite certain that the demolition of the high rise power is not going to happen. It's not going to happen now, but what will happen is good architecture and design and all the rest of it. You know, many modifications and improvements can be made and so forth. You know, so that I think is my, my comment on, on, on the last door. Yeah. Okay. Um, I hope you're right. I think there is some, there is an issue for, is there anyone here lives in, in one of the towers? Well, she may ask, I don't know. Because from what I my, you know, talking to people, it's a harsh living environment and some people really don't like it. Um, so I'm not completely sure whether, how to, if we can improve it or what should be done. I don't want them to be, to, to be demolished. I agree. I hope not. They won't. But, yeah, I'm not I'm not sure what the solution. I mean, um retrofitting, I know the cars on uh, the high rises have been retrofitted doing doing you know that project. So I'm not sure why they need to demolish them now. Yeah. Um I'm just going to ask one question from the people at the Zoom, otherwise uh, they are gonna feel neglected. Yeah. So we have a question here, I believe this one is for Michael. Um, if construction is not limited by approvals, then what is limiting it? How many properties can we realistically build each year? If this is not enough, then in the short term, do we need to consider moderating our migration numbers in the um, to alleviate the current crisis? <laughs> I think that's the fundamental question, isn't it? Um, migration is a huge issue that rouses lots of emotions from different points of view. But the, the fact is that migration is leading to enormous pressure on three main areas of settlement in Australia. It needn't be that way. Um, most people in Europe, in the United States, and much of the rest of the world live in much more dispersed settlements. Um, but in Australia, 63% uh, 60, of, the, of the population live in the five capital cities and mainly Sydney, Melbourne and South East Queensland. And that's, they're the areas that are going to um, have to locate, have to find ways to locate the, the increased numbers of people coming into this country. Um, and they're vast, vast increases. I mean... Whether or not you agree with them is another matter. But the fact of the matter is they're vast numbers of people um, coming into the country and they have to live somewhere. So in a way, I sympathise with the Victorian government because they're responding to this pressure uh, and it comes down to numbers of dwellings. Um, we built about 750,000 new dwellings in Melbourne from 2005 to 2022, right? Three quarters of a million. Um, the government is wanting 800,000 built, right? Um, to cater for the immediate increased population. And they're, they're, they're talking around 10 years sometimes. I mean, it's, it's just impossible to meet, right? It can't be done. And it can't be done because 
the means to do it don't exist. You can go on a we, governments, the local councils and governments can go on approving any numbers of development numbers that they that they want. But that doesn't mean that they're going to be built. And we know that the vast number of approvals are not all being built now. So <clears throat> approvals are one thing, construction is another. And the issue that we're facing as a city is if this huge number of increased migrants are coming into the country, and it looks like that's going to continue, how and where are they going to be located? Infrastructure Victoria, two weeks ago, put out a, a report which looked at five scenarios. It was a, a time that there was some proper scenario planning done. I did one with one of the authors of the Infrastructure Re Australia report, who now works for Infrastructure Infrastructure Victoria, I mean. Uh, we did one of the only scenario pieces of work in 2016, and now Infrastructure Victoria looked at five. One of them was um, a network city model, so that you have Ballarat, Bendigo, Geelong, and other, other big um, regional settlements as a source for as, as a, a, um, a locational um, analysis, um, how many people could go there. And they recommended against it. They said there were some advantages, but to do it, you'd have to have tremendously expensive public transport connections from Melbourne and between the cities, right? From Geelong to Ballarat and so on. And we're talking here fast rail, serious fast rail, European style fast rail, plus all the other services. Um, and the fact of the matter is it's cheaper to locate people in existing settlements. And it's cheaper to put people in the established city than it is in the new outer suburbs, vastly cheaper. So the Victorian government's solution, put as many people as possible in the middle ring suburbs in particular. Right? You can see why. There's reasoning behind it, right? There's pressure and it's cheaper. But the challenge that we have as a community is that this is going to have to happen the way things are going. How are we best able to do it? And what I'm arguing is that you can do it in a better way than what they're proposing. Right? We don't have to turn Melbourne into a series of high-rise and medium-rise apartment precincts, and that's what's going to happen. Right under the current authoritarian approach, we can do it better, and we have done it better. Right, there's been two hundred thousand new um, approvals in the middle ring suburbs, uh, mainly in the last twelve years. Right, we can do it, but it's got to be carefully done, and it's called planning. It's not called neoliberal opening up everything and let the development industry work it out to suit themselves and leave the city and us with the problems to pick up forever. It's called planning. And what really annoys me is that the government has given up on planning. Right? So in answer to the question, that's the challenge. I sympathise with the problem. I wouldn't like to be in government at the moment. You know, I'm able to swan around as a retired academic, you know, pontificating about all the things that they should be doing. It's fantastic fun, but it's serious, right? It's really serious. And unless, unless we as a community come up with better solutions and force the government to revisit them, then Melbourne is going to be turned into a dysfunctional city that is not going to work. And we're all going to have to pay the price. Okay, so I think she was well, the first one should be okay. yeah. um, just a comment, I think, backing off the back of that question, which is that I think in order to, uh, we've got a crap load of approvals, but not a lot of construction. Um, so something needs to be done to incentivize construction potentially, because I think what happens, I'm an architect, kind of worked a lot with developers, um, they land back. They hold on yeah. to their approvals. They hold on to their property until the market is right to develop. And at the moment, it's really hard to make a good profit on a development. Yeah. 
So that's one of our big problems at the moment. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that I wanted, particularly Michael, but I'm interested if Iris also has a comment on this, is um, to understand is um, you talked a lot about the way forward is community consultation and um, co-design and probably collaboration working with the community. And I think that's um, proven to be very successful. Um, however, what we never seem to solve is that um, future residents have no democratic rights. They have no voice in a consultation process because they're not there in the community yet. Mm -hmm. So how do we tackle that? Because, you know, yes, we point fingers at NIMBYism, but it does actually exist. Mm -hmm. um, we've got this similar planning pro approvals process already in New South Wales, yeah. and you do see in um, a lot of kind of the richer suburbs that the high rise development goes in really atrocious places to live because their voters, you know, like in certain areas, <laughs> don't kind of get an eye in. And so it's sort of, you know, it's all po political. So how do we actually give those who don't have a voice a voice in the future as well? I'm curious to know what you think. Um, very good points. Um, Look on on the on the NIMBY thing, and Sydney's a bit different from Melbourne, right? Yeah. There's lots of differences. Um, but look, you know, I I just look back to my local government days. I spent ten years in local government, right, in two councils, and maybe you know, maybe I'm naive, maybe I'm optimistic, you know, maybe I'm softer than I should be. But I believe the proper consultation and participation usually leads to better outcomes. Right, and as you said, you're right. All over the world, this is done, and we get better outcomes for everybody. Right, the the developer makes money, the government's happy because it's happening, and people are happy. Right, but there's got to be proper participation programs, not this nonsense where you walk into a consultation program and someone barrels you and takes you over to the corner because they won't let people talk together. Right, it's called managed consensus. Wonderful term, isn't it? Yeah. Now, on your point of future, the future people are going to have a vote. Look, the best example of that is outer urban development today, right? There's about 50% still, despite all the promises of the breakup, only 30% out in the, out in the outer new, new growth areas, it's still around 50%. It has been since about 2007. Right, oh, up and down a bit, but and we're we're de we're developing the worst suburbs, the most unlivable places on the planet, and I mean that, yeah. excepting for the worst slums in the world, right? And even they're often better because you have much better communities who, you know, I mean, I know that there's a lot of romanticism about this, you know, the Mumbai thing and. But look, they're bad. There are people who can't get out of their own their own little street-based area because there's one exit to a two-lane road. It's taking them up to an hour to get even out onto the street. Shocking services. Anyway, I won't go on to it. Now, we're developing these suburbs with no sunlight coming into most of the houses, badly designed, appallingly serviced, and... You know, I'm involved in a group called Charter 29. It's, it's a group of old, disaffected architects, right? <laughs> we've, got, we've got a meeting with the minister in a week to, and we've put out four reports and, the, and we've talked it through all the government and they all say, this is right, it's terrible out there, it's awful, right? But no one does anything about it. And so what we're doing is designing a, a living place for another million and a quarter people in Melbourne in the next 30 years, right? And none of them have a vote about the kind of living environment they're going into. And it's it really gets me that, that the decisions we're making today are so bad for so many people in the future. By the way, it's not just housing that we're doing that, is it? So you're right. So my answer... We've got to do better now with our governance structures, our procedures, our design. It, it's all doable. It just needs someone like Gough Whitlam to reappear. <laughs> Where are you, Gough? <laughs>
I've worked with housing communities for the last 27 years, yeah. mostly the older person towers, and I really want to encourage people not to put down towers as, as a claim. They're varied, they yeah. differ, and the people, it's their first real sense of home. And I've been talking to some of those households who are devastated that they had people knocking at their door to talk to them about the future of their home. So I think we need to be very aware of the disruption and the impact on people's health, particularly in the older person towers, yeah. which on a whole have been kept updated mm -hmm. um, compared to some of the places that I've looked at for private rental for people. They're far more safe and secure than a lot of others. Some have any problems, some don't. So they're, they're varied. And I think the blanket statement of the towers are terrible. Mm -hmm. When we know all of them down St Kilda Road, mm -hmm. Port Melbourne, all around residential towers are being built. Yeah. Yeah. So tower living is not necessarily inherently a bad thing. And I think it's really important to also realise the re-traumatising effect currently having over the last few weeks on people who really thought that was their home to stumps and now they're saying, I'm going to lose it all again and that impact on their health. So I think it's really important to be aware of what we're abandoning about is, is impacting. Yeah, I agree. And uh, thanks for the comment. Um, I don't think um, all the towers are the same and not horrible. I agree. And it's been very, very difficult for everyone who lives currently in, in a public housing tower because they they heard what's going on. Mm -hmm. And especially if the 500 people or more or households, I'm not sure, that have been notified that they're going to need to relocate. I'm sure it's it, the uncertainty is very, very difficult. And also the other issue is that, you know, why, I understand why, but but still it's worth asking the question, why does the government target public housing when they don't target other yeah. high rises that may have issues as well? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Um, Janet, no? yeah. um, we've got a number of really serious key problems. First of all, we now look as though the next federal election will be fought on an anti-immigration and it will be racist. We've just had a devastating result in the uh, referendum. We know that that's the way you whip people up. And yet we face a world with a climate crisis where there are millions and millions of people who will be fleeing, and particularly coming from the Ganges Gange Valley through Myanmar and wanting to get refuge somewhere here. We can't shut our eyes to the outside world. We're, no. we're going to have, we are a country of immigrants. We cannot shut our belt off. We have to find ways to cope, to welcome people, and to have them live amongst us. Now, the real problem with housing is the cost. And people aren't buying houses because they can't afford them. They are having trouble getting rents they can afford. So the private market is broken. And there's no way that the private market can solve the housing problem because we have too much money, all of our wealth invested in property. And throughout the economy, the cost of property drags money out, active money out of the economy. Every single item you buy, every service you take, a part of that is the cost of the property. And commercial property is just as ridiculously expensive as housing. And then we've got all these millions of people in Australia who've got their whole self and, and, and life history and all their wealth invested in their own property. Mm -hmm. And this is an enormous barrier to change, mm -hmm. an enormous barrier to being able to make things better because you're hitting at the most profound sense of people's identity. And yet we cannot go on like this. Mm -hmm. We have the housing problem is that there is a shortage of affordable rental housing in 
seats like who you want. That's why we voted here. Though. There's a shortage of affordable rental housing in North Melbourne. And thank goodness that the uh, legacy estate in Molesworth Street has been demolished. Those walk-ups, there were three stories. Nearly all the tenants were people with disability. There were no lifts. There was no insulation. They were freezing in winter and boiling in summer. They had no laundries, which are accessible. They were delighted, the ones I've spoken to, to be moved to the high rise in North Melbourne, which had been done up, and they got a flat which had been prepared. And if they wish, they could go back, and they will not be living any longer in an isolated community of everybody else uh, with, with problems like their own. There'll be some children around. There'll be young people around. There'll be young professionals. And in that very dense settlement that's now been built around the new school, so it's also made it possible to build a new school on that government land, there will be affordable apartments. And they're cheaper because they're on government land. And the same thing has happened in Kensington, which has been a very successful redevelopment of the House of the State, where they had to pull down that big high rise because it was falling down. It was structurally unsound. It was a nightmare. Now, people have found they could buy into those places because they're cheaper because of the stigma of public housing. And gradually over time, the stigma diminishes. Now, in North Melbourne, thanks to this man here when he was Minister for Housing, all of the walk-ups were replaced in the 1970s and 80s. Sorry, the 1980s. All of those people were displaced and came back. And there's a whole new, you wouldn't know it was public housing. Now, we still have the high rise. Perhaps some of the road cave, but I think the humidity is not very good in climate change. The lift don't work very well. They're not very good for family. Some of the ones we had in Melbourne, Richard, we cut through walls so that they had six bedrooms in the flats. You know, there's been a lot happening, mm. but if they are past their time, by the time if they all come down, like it, it'll be 26 years, another quarter of a century, those buildings will be too old. Now, at some point, if we're socialists, mm. we have to say the interests of the whole community and the interests of the future generations, we have to take responsibility. And that responsibility for everyone has to overcome the needs of some individuals to hang on to a, a lump of wealth, which uh, they're protecting in, in a very selfish way. So we've got, this country was founded by people who wanted that. The great joy of coming to Australia was that you would own a bit of dirt. And so that's been the most important part of being Australian and stolen the land we were going to have it for ourselves. And that now sits as a big lump in the way of progress and development and fairness. Thank you. I don't know anyone. No, no um, I'll just uh, do a, a follow up in, that came from the people at home. Um, if the um, the car, look, if we have a, a difficulties building, right? There's a, a, the construction industry is um, is going through a lot of trouble. Demolishing the towers and then constructing something new there is going to suck up some of the, you know, the the, the 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 construction capacity and then put us in an even worse situation. <laughs> Long question and it's very yeah. Okay, yeah. Thanks, Michael, for your talk today, Iris. It was really good. Um, we seem to be uh, faced with an intractable problem. I was a bit of a lump by what you were saying about uh, the inability to develop regional areas. I mean, the Liberal Party made an effort at it a while ago. But, if it's so much uh, uh, less costly to be in Melbourne, it seems like we will never develop regional Victoria. And the question then becomes, I think, 
what's the tipping point for Melbourne? We might solve the problem immediately and can solve the political dilemma for our leaders. But what ultimately we would like, and along the way, what do we do with all the traffic? What what is the answer for Australia? Good question. <laughs> we rattled that one. <laughs> look, 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 worry. I mean, that's a, that's a fun. That's probably that or one of the fundamental questions. And what worries me is that <clears throat> the governments aren't looking ahead in that way. Um, from what I can see, they're not. They're not saying, look, if we if we redevelop, say, in, in, in the scenario that they've adopted, if we redevelop Melbourne into a series of hundreds, literally hundreds of precincts of medium and high-rise apartments, right? That's the long-term, medium to long-term option they put forward. What does that mean for the way people will live and how they will adjust and how they will function? Will, will that city function? <clears throat> so when we look at London, uh, I mean, there's two cities in Western Europe the size of what Melbourne is going to become if we believe governments, Paris and London, right? That's it. And Berlin is about three, three 3.25 million people, right? People don't live in these vast cities. And by the way, most people in America don't live. We're, we're used to these ideas of, you know, these massive, these massive, um, you know, Los Angeles and San Francisco and New York and so on. But most people in America don't live in those kind of arrangements, right? We're different. Now, how can, I think you're right. Um, I don't think, it's not going to change um, this focus of this concentration of population. And I, I also blame urban geographers for this because they, they think it's wonderful to have a whole lot of people in one spot so you get ideas and people bouncing off each other, you know. I, I was never any good at geography. Um, so what is it going to mean? Now, that's the only worry I have, that they, governments aren't looking ahead to model, well, if we do this as a, as a scenario, what does it mean for the way, what does it mean for traffic? What does it mean for the way people live? How important is amenity? Well, we know it's critically important to mental health and the way people adjust to each other and the world. If you pull down a city or much of it and you rebuild another one, what is it going to mean for the way people interact and so on? Um, these aren't the questions that are being asked. Uh, they're not even, I don't think they're on the radar. So um, unless we actually go there and start to figure it out, um, we're going to, I think, make a series of really serious errors um, and we're going to turn Melbourne into something very different. And it's back to the, the point earlier, once it's done, it's not going to be easily undone. Mm -hmm. And just one other final example. Um, the government, say, has looked ahead on transport for the, 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 um, the circular rail route, the, the the um the suburban rail loop rail rail um, loop um running around the middle ring sort of a bit, bit further out from into the ring sort of middle to outer suburban uh area now when you look at that rail loop it's all designed to cater for growth and we can say well this is an example of the government looking ahead saying we're going to redevelop you know in initially these these nine mega precincts, right? And that's where a, another big lump of the, the, the increased population of Melbourne are going to go, right, into these suburban rail precincts. And the theory says mixed use, um, concentrated, concentrated um, consolidated development around rail is great. So the government is saying we're going to put all these people you know, into they have, by the way, I haven't told us how many people are going into the into the precincts. They've been very careful. I've calculated about a million people could fit there, and the government hasn't answered that. Um, but let's suppose it's half a million, a million. The rail loop is catering for them, not for the existing residents. So you can say it's a, it's an answer to your question, 
This is an example of the government looking ahead, saying that we're going to put all these people in these precincts, we'll link them up together through a rail loop and then connect them up with a radio, radial rail loop. It looks great on paper, but it's, it's catering for growth. But it's doing nothing for anybody living between those stations. So if you look at Cheltenham to um, Clayton, it's eight kilometres, and you won't be able to get on that rail 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 line from Cheltenham to to Clayton, right? Because there's no entry to it. There's only a stop at Cheltenham and Clayton. Now no one's going to drive back to Clayton to get onto the suburban rail uh, back to Cheltenham to get onto the suburban rail route. So they're coming up with solutions that are trying to cater for the increased growth. So you can say that's a good it's a, a good thing from your question, but there are lots of other problems associated with that, and I, I just worry that they're not looking ahead to to even model those. Um, yeah. Um, Jeff, you were saying. I want to shift the conversation slightly sideways to pick up a word that has been. <clears throat> I'm very nervous about this, so just cope, all right? Um, <laughs> pick up a word that's been used several times in the conversation that have passed over, and that is consultation. Now, most projects that have any heft behind them have to have a consultative process built into them. It almost never happens in a way that is productive. Consultation for most, most uh, purposes means counting heads, making sure that we've got as many men as women in the, in the room, and, and that we, um, we voice our opinions on particular topics that the organiser has decided will be the topics for discussion. So I'm suggesting that we, and it's a, that there is a very important focus to be placed on the consultation process. I spent the best year of my working life, it took a year, organising a conference for nearly 200 people in Melbourne, which was called Designing the Workplace of the Future. And the process that was followed was a process which had started in the 1960s, perhaps, um, a famous Australian, who's probably not more well known to many of you, a, an academic called uh, Fred Emery, was responsible for producing a theory of consultation which would produce results that made sense for projects large or small. Now, I've used this myself quite often with small groups, and it has always been received as a successful decision-making process. It's much harder with big groups, but I think with the questions that are so vital in this discussion, it's terribly important to make sure that we focus on what that consultation means, because what you put into it is what you'll get out. That's all you need. Um, I'm going to move the um, questioning even further sideways. Um, and my question really goes to the level of consultation between government departments and to what extent they look at each other's priorities and try and rationalise them when they're making these kind of decisions. And what I'm thinking about specifically is that when we're talking about people in housing, it's people, but lots of other things live in cities. Um, and... Um, in Melbourne in particular, um, we've got an area that's used as a refuge for um, you know, species that aren't urban when, uh, when there's droughts or when there's you know, other kind of disasters outside of Melbourne. And we've also got, and I know this because I spoke to the head herpetologist at Melbourne, um, at Melbourne Museum, um, there are two, this is an example, okay? There are two populations of marbled gecko. One of them lives out quite close to the South Australian border. The other one lives in Melbourne. They are genetically distinct subspecies. The Melbourne population only lives in Melbourne. So if, we, if we're not looking at, firstly, you know, what Ingrid Stitt's doing with her 2037 biodiversity increasing, you know, um, her planning, um, we're just looking at housing or how we're gonna house people. 
And if we're not doing any kind of assessment beforehand about what's going when we take things away, um, there seems to me to be, you know, we're sort of saying, we're, well, we're doing this to make it all environmentally friendly, but we're not necessarily the things that are already hidden there. Just if, any comments? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, well, <clears throat> look, I think it's absolutely critical that we have cross-sector decision-making, and that's what we're not getting. Um, and one of the reasons is mega departments, uh, which the theory said if you have mega departments, you'll have a series of department of agencies or, or former departments grouped around each other um, in a conglomerate, and they'll have to talk to each other, but it hasn't turned out that way. The Commonwealth did a, a big study <clears throat> on this, which um, Brian will remember about 15 years ago by um, the former head of the Victorian, former head of the Victorian um, Public Service, and, and and came up with a damning critique of the lack of cross sectoral decision making at the Commonwealth level, and and the same thing operates at the state level. <laughs> There's still cabinet papers prepared that that, that um, departments comment on. At least that's still happening. But if we go back to the, I hate to do this, the terrible old suburban rail loop again, I mean, it was a thought bubble by the Premier in consultation with a couple of um, people he knew in uh, that led to a, a consultant, initial consulting report, and the Transport Department didn't even know about it, much less the, the Land Use Planning Department. So there was no cross-sectoral uh, um, involvement in, a, in, a, in probably the greater... Well, certainly Victoria's biggest infrastructure project. So it's absolutely critical that we have cross-sectoral decision-making. That is, decisions that allow every affected agency and other participating affected group to understand the impacts on them of the proposal. So you have reciprocal impacts evaluated from a proposal. So the proposal will cause an impact and those impacts will have feedback up to the proposal to make it viable or it'll have other impacts. So you have reciprocal impacts um, at every sector analysed in coming to a decision. The last government that really believed in that was the Kane government, and it, and it did it quite well, in, in Victoria, that is. The Kane government did it quite well. It had a cross-sectoral policy, and it followed it generally quite well. Um, but we have to get back to it. So I think that's all we have time for tonight. I will um, let uh, Jeff, the chair of the Victorian branch, do the closing. Uh, just, just to be here. I can't. I can do it. No, no, no. It's all good. Ah, oh, there you go. Yep. Yeah. Uh, thanks very much, Fernanda, for running the meeting tonight. Thank you very much, Michael and Iris. Um, it was so interesting, but we're going to go away feeling so angry and so uh, <laughs> depressed that I, can, I, I don't know what, what we're going to do to change this, uh, to change the future that you've um, painted for us. I hope to goodness that we can.